Thank you for joining us in the second week of Lent. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from thy ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of thy word. Jesus Christ, thy Son, who with thee and the Holy Spirit liveth and reigneth one God forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliza of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of Ch Chaldons to give you this land to possess. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them too, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reciting Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? When evil doers came upon me to eat up blood by my flesh, it was they, my foes and my adversaries, who stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, yet my heart shall not be afraid. And though war should rise up against me, yet will I put my trust in him. One thing I have asked of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the fair beauty of the Lord, and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he shall keep me safe in his shelter. He shall hide me in the secrecy of his dwelling, and set me high upon a rock. Even now he lifts up my head above my enemies round about me. Therefore I will offer in his dwelling an oblation with sounds of great gladness. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hearken to my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. You speak in my heart and say, Seek my face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not your face from me nor turn away your servant in displeasure. You have been my helper. Cast me not away. Do not forsake me, O God, my salvation. Though my father and my mother forsake me, 
the Lord will sustain me. Show me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Deliver me not into the hand of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and also those who speak malice. What if I had not believed that I should see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? O oh, tarry and await the Lord's pleasure. Be strong, and he shall comfort your heart. Wait patiently for the Lord. Our second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to Luke, glory to you, Lord Christ. At that very hour, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet, Today, tomorrow, the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. feels very chaotic now. So many things that we have seen in the news with the war in Ukraine, residual economic effects from the pandemic, rising energy prices, and on top of all of it, you guys all act like you lost an hour of sleep last night. <laughs> I am reminded that no matter what happens in the world, it is always the poorest and most vulnerable who suffer. Those who cannot afford to get out of harm's way are the ones who always pay for the sins of the greedy and power-driven. Those with power exert it onto those without, most often unintentionally, but sometimes violently. These kinds of things represent our bro the brokenness of our human nature and how we People take God's perfect justice and we twist it into something that is an, an injustice. This Thursday, what is Thursday coming up? St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. Now, I bet we all probably know this because we all remember, you know, we've seen the Chicago River turn green, we've had corned beef and cabbage and all those things, but very few of us probably actually know the story of St. Patrick. Patrick was born 
in around the year 390 AD in what is today the west of England. His family were Romans. Uh, and they had been Christians for several generations. In fact, his father was a deacon. His grandfather was a priest. And so this was a multi-generational clergy family. But this was a very chaotic time in Roman Britain. If you can imagine the year 390 was just shy of a century before the fall of Rome, but the empire around them was crumbling and was spiraling into collapse. And the region where he lived in Britain would, have, would very quickly uh, slip in and out of imperial control. It must have felt very much in this time like it was the end of the world. Everything was coming undone around them. By the time that Patrick had turned 20, the Roman Empire had completely abandoned the island of Great Britain. So even though Patrick came from a Christian family, it seems that in his youth he was not terribly interested in religion. Surprise, surprise. I mean, really, PK. We all, you know, we've heard those stories, right? But at 16, he was out and about, and he was kidnapped by Irish pirates, really, and sold into slavery in Ireland. He spent six years in Ireland during which time, as many people would in times of great struggle and grief, he found himself leaning more and more into, onto his faith. Well, at tw age 22, Patrick escaped and he made his way back to Britain, uh, only to find that, of course, as I mentioned, the Roman Empire had completely collapsed around where he had grown up in those six years, and everything had drastically changed. At this point, he decided to study for the priesthood. He spent time in what is today France, and in 435, he was commissioned by bishops in France to go back to Ireland, which you can only imagine must have been quite a terrifying command to, to follow. Well, he did, in fact, return to Ireland. He set up monasteries and schools, and it seems that single-handedly, this one man converted the entire island from paganism to Christianity. Now, that is a little bit of the bio of the saint that we remember this week, but what I find really amazing about St. Patrick's story is he was a person who experienced injustice. There is no doubt about that. And what's incredible about this is, despite experiencing injustice, he returned it with justice. He went from being a person of not having power to a person of authority. And when he gained his own power of authority, he didn't lord it over those who had oppressed him, but he used it for good. <clears throat> You've heard the expression, the fox guarding the hen house. And this seems to be very much what was going on with the kingship of Herod in the first century, jumping back quite a bit in time, but to our gospel reading. <clears throat> in the gospel, it says that some Pharisees came to G and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, there's something really important here. Um, you notice it is the Pharisees who have concern for Jesus. Now, when we think about Pharisees, what do we usually mean, right? We usually say things like, oh, she can be such a Pharisee about this, right? You know, you hear that and we kind of imagine this hypocritical thing. But this, in fact, was could not be further from the truth about the actual Pharisees. The Pharisees were not the bad guys. <clears throat> they were the rabbis of the day. They were teachers of the law. And in fact, I'll give you another thing that might really blow your mind. If the Pharisees were rabbis, and what does Mary Magdalene call Jesus when she first sees him in the, from the tomb? 
Rabbi, and what does that say then about Jesus? He was himself a Pharisee. <clears throat> so what's really interesting about how the gospel seems to handle Pharisees, we're reading this, remember, 2,000 years later and looking back. What we don't see is what's happening with the Pharisees is an internal conflict. This is not demonizing all these people who are Pharisees, but it's actually, it would be like me coming along and saying, you know, sometimes my clergy colleagues just really drive me crazy. Well, it doesn't mean that I think clergy are bad. It just means that sometimes we have internal disagreements. And just like any institution, what we see in the framing of Pharisees is that internal conflict. But here you, you notice that they are seeing him as one of their own. And they come up and they say, hey, we have to warn you, something bad is about to happen. They're his allies in this case. Jesus' response is kind of interesting. Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I finish my work. So what's funny is this, Jesus frames Herod as a predator, a fox. Now, let's be honest about foxes. And, I mean, I see them like walking around my neighborhood. Uh, you know, they cross the road. I don't think I have ever seen a fox and actually felt afraid of one. I mean, they're kind of small. They sort of look like dogs. They probably, I've never actually heard of one attacking a person. They're not really like, a dangerous animal to humans like a lion or a wolf would be. But a fox is, in fact, a danger to small animals, very vulnerable animals. To the most vulnerable, things like mice and birds and, you know, maybe even cats, a fox is actually a danger. But then Jesus makes this reference to Jerusalem and Jesus' upcoming death. He says, it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. And then he laments, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Now, this is not just a historic truth. It's widely accepted. Um, but it also frames Jesus as a prophet. Again, it talks about this as this what's going on in these internal dynamics. The next line kind of ties into earlier with Herod. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. A mother animal would do anything to protect her young. And it's just that, and this is another allusion to what he called Herod, a fox. Again, a fox is not a major predator but it would have no problem gobbling up little chicks. The chicks are the people of God, the people of Israel. Jesus longs to protect them and like a mother hen. But of course, the challenge is, what would that fox also do to the mother hen? Probably wouldn't fare so well either. And this tells us it's a little bit of a foreshadow. Kind of like Jesus saying, on the third day I am finished, saying that he himself will be sacrificed for them in Jerusalem. A city whose name, whose very name, actually means place of peace, and yet has been known over the centuries to have killed the prophets. The St. Paul says in the letter to the Philippians, brothers and sisters join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have told you, I have often told you of them, and even now I tell you with tears. And then he says, their minds are set on earthly things. Friends, we are people of God, and we people of God, as all people of faith, are called to set our minds not on earthly things, 
but on heavenly things. When we understand power and privilege, we can use it not for evil or injustice, but to set things right and bring God's justice to our world. God's justice is love. It is embracing and empowering those who are powerless. It is imitating Christ and bringing that love to this world.